Welcome everyone to the program that we're gonna have this evening. My name is Susan Ferris Wrights. I'm the co-president of the League of Women Voters for Northeast Westchester. And with me is Laura Engelhart, who is a league member who lives in New Jersey. We're gonna take a few minutes and see a uh, video that we created, and then we're gonna have a Q&A session that comes afterwards. I'd like to give you a little background as to how this project actually came to be. What happened was in uh, 2018, we embarked on writing a book about the suffragist movement as seen through the music of the movement. And we did that. I actually did that with some high school interns that I had for six weeks in the spring. And we created this publication and we were done with it, we thought. And then later we decided that we would wanna check all the copyrights on the book, make sure that it was you know, totally correct in terms of what was quoted in it. And I asked Laura to get involved in the project. Um, we actually contracted with the Rutgers Law Clinic to start to address some of the copyright issues which they were very willing to do. They were pretty excited about helping us out, that type of thing. And then Laura took this project and basically rewrote the book to a large extent using some interns from Hamilton College and created a really great publication that we were able to then put on Amazon for sale as a fundraiser device for our local league. And we started to sell books. What then happened was we had planned um, to take the book to the National uh, League of Women Voters Convention that was supposed to occur that summer. And we were gonna start to promote it to the leagues across the United States and try to you know, really get, get some interest in it. But COVID took that opportunity away from us. So what we did was we pondered and Laura came up with this great idea and uh, she can talk a little bit about what happened next with a group of interns from Hamilton College. So because COVID had shut everything down and we were, and, you know, this was the centennial of uh, the 19th Amendment, we wanted to enable local leagues around the country to really be able to celebrate it. Um, while we had originally conceived of the book as an opportunity, not just as a fundraiser, but really as a way to jumpstart programming, our plan had been to use that as sort of like a book group kind of thing in local libraries and local leagues and to do in-person programming using the book as a launch launching place. But because of COVID, obviously all in-person gatherings were shut down. And so instead what we decided to do or what I decided to do after getting a plea from Hamilton uh, that none of the college students could do their internships and their jobs and they were sad and stuck in at home and in dorm rooms and whatnot. Um, I said, well, huh, do we have any film majors or people who are interested in doing a short documentary? Um, and we actually got a lot of interest. So um, actually a student who had to come home from her internship in Eastern Europe where she was supposed to have created a film, uh, I think she was in Prague um, or, or either, either in the Czech Republic or Hungary, she had to come back obviously because of COVID. And so she was thrilled to be able to work on this project. And she was actually an international student. So she didn't know anything about the history of the feminist movement in the United States. She found it fascinating. She was actually uh, from India. And so she wound up directing the film uh, I wrote the script, um, and we had another intern who did a lot of the a lot of the images. She did so much research to really really make this movie um, come to life. Um, and so the objective was to create uh, Zoom programming that was really plug and play for local leagues around the country, and a lot of people used it. Um, we got great feedback um, from the West Coast, from the South, um, from uh, you know Midwest. All across uh, the United States, different leagues use this to help them commemorate the centennial. Um, it's a short film. We created a discussion guide that sort of ranges. So if anybody wants to click on the website, I'm sure we can 
um, share links around later on, you can see the type of questions because this, this um, video that we're about to watch together has been seen by, um, by high school students uh, all the way up to, you know, people who are in their 70s and 80s. Uh, I don't think we had any uh, anybody who was around during the centennial because I'm sure they would have said something, but that would have been awesome, you know. Um, in any event, um, Susan, so, I don't know yeah. if we just want to get started with the yeah. film. I think I think we, we would um, like to get started for the film. So we're going to ask Carrie to take it away. <laughs> Today, the ability to vote in elections is seen as an ordinary right of citizenship. Yet for most of our country's history, voting was a privilege bestowed upon a very small percentage of the general population. Fortunately, over the past 200 years, our country has recognized the importance of extending the franchise to more people, and through changes in state and federal law, the right to vote has gradually been extended to most U.S. adults. In this country, voting is the primary path to political agency. The fact that voters have the ability to kick elected officials out of office, out of power, gives voters power. Their opinions matter. So determining who should be allowed to cast a ballot is a serious issue for both politicians as well as the population at large. August 26, 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the day all U.S. women won the right to vote. At the time, it was a close question, decided by the ballot cast by one freshman representative in the Tennessee State House. The women's movement had spent decades building support for the enfranchisement of women, and in 1920, they succeeded by the skin of their teeth. Until the ratification of the 15th Amendment, the question of who was entitled to vote was very much a matter of state law. Before the 19th Amendment was passed, proponents of women's suffrage were divided on the tactical question of how best to achieve the right to vote for women. Because voting rights are intrinsically a state law matter, many suffragists focused on changing state laws and constitutions. Others saw how the 15th Amendment changed the law throughout the country in one fell swoop and focused their advocacy at the federal level. During the early 20th century, women made strides on both of these fronts, with 20 states and territories granting women at least some voting rights before 1920. My home state, New Jersey, was not one of them. New Jersey women only regained the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment. Yes, I said regained. From 1776 until 1807, some New Jersey women did have the right to vote. In the days of the early republic, it was common for voting rights to be limited to white men who owned a certain amount of real property and had a certain religion. Indeed, states like New Jersey that allowed people to vote if they could prove a net worth of at least 50 pounds in wealth, whether in land or in goods, were considered rather progressive since New Jersey law did not require a resident to own land to be able to participate in our democracy. But New Jersey was even more progressive because the New Jersey Constitution did not limit the franchise to white men. The state constitution afforded the right to vote to anyone, female, African-American, foreigner, anyone who had resided in the state for at least one year and owned at least 50 pounds of wealth. Of course, married women couldn't own property. They were considered property of their husbands themselves, so this law only affected widowed or unmarried women. But for 31 years in New Jersey, many women could and did vote. What's fascinating about this story is the ease with which these women, along with non-white men and non-citizens, were disenfranchised in 1807. Why did it happen? During the lead-up to the 1808 presidential election, the Democratic-Republican Party dominated New Jersey politics, and Federalists were very much a minority voice in the statehouse. However, 
Republican President Jefferson's embargo policies were deeply unpopular with New Jersey voters, and the state Republicans were desperate to stave off a Federalist victory in the upcoming election. Unfortunately for party leadership, New Jersey Republicans were bitterly divided. From 1806 to 1807, the two wings of the party, the liberal majority and the moderate minority, disagreed on everything, including who was entitled to vote. All Republicans agreed that the right to vote distinguished free men from slaves, but while liberals believed that all people with a financial interest in the community were entitled to vote, moderates wanted the franchise limited, as it was in other states. State Republican infighting came to a head in 1807 over the location of a new courthouse in Essex County. Moderate New Jersey Republicans wanted the courthouse built in Elizabeth, while the liberals wanted it to stay in Newark. This fight escalated into accusations of voter fraud and near-violent bickering among state politicians. Party leadership was desperate to unify their fractured party before the 1808 election and sought to find a compromise to bring both wings together. They succeeded at the expense of New Jersey women. In the broker compromise, Liberal Republicans backed the passage of a new state law that stripped the right to vote from women, along with black men and resident foreigners. In exchange, moderates agreed to keep the courthouse in Newark. While it may seem like New Jersey liberals traded away women's voting rights in order to save themselves the inconvenience of traveling an extra six miles to go to court, their agreement to the compromise may have stemmed from a tactical decision. You see, New Jersey women tended to vote Federalist, and the liberals might well have believed that by disenfranchising them, they would be helping the Republicans to victory in 1808. In 1807, no one believed that women were equal to men. That's why state legislators could so easily take away women's rights. But despite the widespread belief among prominent legal scholars of the day that the change was unlawful under New Jersey's state constitution, no one challenged it not even the women who had been active voters in the past. It's possible that they understood that until the cultural perception of women had changed, women would never be able to hold on to their rights. And in 1807, that change had not yet come. So women's participation in our democracy was erased, along with other groups also perceived as inferior, African Americans, foreigners, and poor people. Rights once gained can be lost without widespread support. While we are still battling these prejudices today, we've come a long way since 1807. The 1920s suffragists wove the morality of women's suffrage into the fabric of our culture so successfully that modern politicians would find it very difficult to take away our rights now, as they did in 1807. While there are still people today who don't really believe that men and women are equal, This view can no longer be openly expressed in polite company. Yet social change happens much more slowly and haltingly than changes in law. For any change to endure, both paper laws and a society's culture have to adapt. Broad changes in people's lives, like the movement for women's equality, require law and culture to move in a direction that supports the cause. We need political action, marches, rallies, lobbyists, voting— But we also need art, movies, TV shows, cartoons, and yes, even memes. Before the era of cinema, there were songs. Songs that could be shared through broadcast radio and before that through music halls and sheet music sold in dime stores. Music has always been a powerful force for change, both in the 19th century as well as today. Songs of the Suffragists examines the history of American feminism through lyrics. From the Bloomer's Complaint in 1851 all the way to Woman in 2017, these songs reflect the logic and the emotion behind the fight for equal rights. Everything old is new again as we trace feminist history through these songs and discover how the arguments and even symbols of the first suffragists are mirrored in the songs of their successors. The women's suffrage movement really got started in this country in the second half of the 1800s. Many of the radicals who formed the movement were first involved in the other major progressive causes of their day, abolitionism and temperance. These activist leaders took many of the arguments that had successfully won the support for the anti-slavery and anti-tavern causes and applied them to the women's suffrage movement. 
Back then as now, it's simply good marketing to take a winning tactic or slogan from one space and apply it to another. They didn't merely use the same organizing tactics other reformers used to seek changes in law, but also the same symbols and moral appeals to win people over. Legal rights have no real force until those rights are broadly accepted by the general population. This unfortunate truth is best exemplified in the way that the post-Civil War amendments were mooted through application of Jim Crow laws. Laws granting equal rights to marginalized groups have no basis unless they're enforced, and they won't be enforced unless the hearts and minds of the population are with them. The original suffragists fought for the legal right to vote not only by marching in political rallies, but also through songs, cartoons, and plays. From lobbying politicians to singing in the streets, suffragists sought to persuade people to join their cause. Radicals like Alice Paul, who endured hunger strikes, imprisonments, and forced feedings, Lucy Stone, an abolitionist and suffragist who radically refused to take her husband's surname, or Ida B. Wells, whose writings condemn both disenfranchisement and segregation, knew that if they were to win the right to vote as their first step in securing equal rights, they needed to persuade the ordinary population of housewives, widows, doctors, working men, that their cause was worth supporting. Winning hearts and minds is what culture wars are all about, and winning a culture war is even more important than winning a legal battle, given the lax enforcement of unpopular laws. Moreover, cultural changes influence politicians. Take gay rights as a recent example. Without popular TV shows like Will and Grace or Modern Family to help Americans accept the idea of gay relationships, it's unlikely that Lambda Legal would have been able to win their political crusade to make gay marriage legal. Well-known anti-slavery anthem, Battle Hymn of the Republic, was written by the suffragist Julia Ward Howe in 1861. Set to the popular anti-slavery music for John Brown's body, this song became a stirring cry to assert the superior morality of the abolitionist and union cause over the pro-slavery and secessionist side. The Christian imagery in its lyrics from the Lord's Gospel, striking down the serpent, the judgment seat, and Christ's transforming presence— helped link the Union cause to God's cause, elevating people on the Union side to God's side. This song is still included in many Protestant hymnals today. Suffragists, who were often excluded from leadership roles in the abolitionist movement because of their gender, began their activist careers campaigning to free the slaves before joining the movement for women's rights. The arguments of the abolitionist movement can be found in the suffragists' songs and appeals as they too asserted the moral superiority of their cause. The song, Dare You Do It, written by a well-regarded Kansas doctor, is set to the same tune as the battle hymn of the Republic. Men who wronged their mothers and their wives and sisters too How dare you rob companions who are always brave and true How dare you make them servants who are all the world to you Our truth is marching on This song explores the idea that without the franchise, women were made inferior, a concept which wasn't widely accepted as wrong back then and is still not fully accepted today. The imagery of freedom as integral to the fight for women's suffrage was a popular theme after the Civil War, and songs like Daughters of Freedom, The Ballot Be Yours, and Shall Women Vote link the lack of suffrage to slavery. Talk not of freedom, equal rights, cold-hearted, selfish names, while in a land around our hearts dwell twenty million slaves. As the women's suffrage movement was hitting its stride at the turn of the century, anti-suffragists reacted strongly to persuade the public against change. Oh, have you seen Eliza Jane a-cycling in the park? Have you seen Eliza Jane? The people all remark. She shouts, hi, hi. As she rides by, the little doggies bark. For we all have a pain when Eliza Jane goes cycling in the park. 
Eliza Jane was a comedic song written by an anti-feminist in 1895. By titling his main character Eliza Jane, the author was leveraging one of the stock characters from minstrel shows popular in the 1800s. In those racist programs, Eliza Jane appeared as a woman who rejected her suitors. A woman who refuses a man's advances is sometimes labeled unfeminine, which is apropos to this song, where the author mocks and ridicules women fighting for equal rights as embarrassments who are masculine and ridiculous. While the music has been lost to history, the lyrics reflect the author's intent to lampoon women fighting for equal rights. Eliza, dear, we sadly fear you have not started right. You will not see more liberty by being such a fright. Asylums yawn for you, my dear, and in the books we read. How bloomers that too early bloom soon fade and go to sea. Arguably, by naming the modern 20th century girl in his song Eliza Jane after the minstrel character, the lyricist may have also intended to link early feminists to African Americans, thus invoking the pervasive racism of the time to put down non-traditional women. But as the 19th century drew to a close, people fighting for women's political equality focused their arguments in their songs on the matter of fairness. It was unfair that women who were trusted with so much, with the raising of boys to men who could vote, were disenfranchised. Before radio and YouTube, the most effective way to get a musical message out was to add new lyrics to melodies that people were broadly familiar with. These song lyrics were published on broadsheets, often dedicated to famous suffragists. Set to the popular nursery song, Oh Dear, What Can the Matter Be?, the 1884 suffragist song of the same name focuses on all the work that women do that is equal to the work done by men, pointing out the unfairness of their lack of political power. Oh dear, what can the matter be? Dear, dear, what can the matter be? Oh dear, what can the matter be? Women are wanting to vote. Oh dear, what can the matter be? Dear, dear, what can the matter be? Oh dear, what can the matter be? Why should men get every vote? The nineteen fourteen song, How Can Such Things Be, sung to the tune of Old Susanna, conflates voting with freedom. Oh men voters, how can such things be? In all this free America, only one half can be free. The song ends with the idea that failing to grant women suffrage is cheating, attempting to secure the vote like the New Jersey Republicans of 1807 by disenfranchising people instead of trying to win fair and square. If I could run for president, I'd want a good clean fight. I'd want the women by my side, I'd grant their equal right. But ultimately, women claim the right to vote on the basic notion that if a woman is rational enough to raise your sons, then surely she's rational enough to vote. She's good enough to be your baby's mother, and she's good enough to vote These arguments of freedom, fairness, and motherhood also come into play in later feminist songs advocating for reproductive rights. How can a woman be free if the government takes control of her body by denying her health care? Arguably, the 1971 song The Pill by Loretta Lynn did more to normalize birth control in rural America than doctors and social activists of the day. Yeah, I'm making it for all those years since I've got the pill. Indeed, the debates that played out during the original suffrage movement can be found again in the fight to enact the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s and 80s. Phyllis Schlafly was not the first anti-feminist to use the theory that a woman doesn't need equal rights because she already has protection and even more influence on public life through her role as a wife and mother. That argument was also used by many anti-suffragist women in the 1900s, along with the claim that if women got the vote, they'd abandon their families. 
Suffragists countered by claiming it was unfair to ask women to take part in society by raising children and caring for the home while depriving them of a political voice. It's possible that the feminists of the 1970s veered too far from the culturally accepted traditional role of women as they sought to continue the march towards equal rights. Second-wave feminists may have lost the fight for the ERA, in part because they failed to leverage the rallying cries used by the original suffragists, who embraced their roles as wives and mothers to underscore the morality of their cause. Despite the efforts of anti-suffragists, the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, thanks in large part to a letter written by one mother to her 24-year-old son. Dear son... Hurrah and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat with her rats. Is she the one that put rat in ratification? (laughs) No more from Mama at this time. On August 18, 1920, Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify the amendment granting women the right to vote when Harry Byrne changed his mind and voted in favor of the amendment. He was called a traitor to manhood's honor. Byrne explained his last-minute defection from the anti-suffragist cause as follows. I knew that a mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow, and my mother wanted me to vote for ratification. Moreover, I realized this was an opportunity to free 17 million women from political slavery. When women finally gained the right to vote, they took a crucial step towards equality, but the fight was far from over in 1920. The songs of later feminists underscore their efforts to win the right to own and control their own property, to receive equal pay for equal work, and most notably, to be free from domestic violence and sexual assault an ongoing battle that has culminated in the Me Too movement of the 2010s. Recorded in 1966, Nina Simone's Four Women traces the history of African-American women throughout the years, capturing the subjugation, rape, and abuse heaped upon them. My father was rich and white. He forced my mother late one night. Here I am, what do they call me? My name is Sephronia. Almost every genre of popular music features iconic songs that highlight violence against women. From the 1923 blues hit by Bessie Smith. I made sweet papa To the pop hit Summer Nights from the 1978 movie Grease. During the early 1990s, both the R&B group TLC as well as Riot Girl rock band Bikini Kill sang about how a man's story of rape and abuse will be believed over a woman's. The story form of country music lyrics often include abuse-revenge narratives sung by women, including Dixie Chick's hit Goodbye Earl and Miranda Lambert's song Gunpowder and Lead from her double platinum album Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Women had been singing about rape and domestic abuse for decades by the time Alyssa Milano's tweet kicked off the Me Too movement in 2017. 
Over the past few years, the women's movement has achieved real success in denormalizing rape and sexual abuse, because in 2020, having sex with an incapacitated woman is finally being viewed as socially unacceptable. This is a tremendous change from 1984, when the movie Sixteen Candles played this exact situation off as a joke in a PG rom-com. Social change, though painstakingly slow, has happened. In all, protest movements alone cannot change prevailing norms, nor can pop culture. But when combined, the two can become a powerful force to transform our society for the better. Protesters and activists can lead us towards change, but only when the general public is persuaded can the changes they champion endure. The idea that women should not vote seems almost inconceivable now, but 100 years ago that wasn't the case. It was through the combined efforts of activists and quiet supporters that women took a step towards full equality. Indeed, without the right to vote, women could never have gained the influence on politics or social culture that they have today. We are making great progress, but there is still much to do before we can achieve the equitable society that the suffragists first envisioned over a century ago. To continue our march towards full equality, we must use the mediums of our modern era, creating songs for YouTube and memes for text messaging, along with TV shows and movies. Only if we continue to write our new songs of suffrage will the concept of gender equality become so ingrained in our culture that, 100 years from today, people may likewise wonder how that notion could have ever been in doubt. My name is Laura Engelhart, and I'm one of the authors of Songs of the Suffragists, published by the League of Women Voters of Berkeley Heights, New Providence, and Summit. The League of Women Voters was founded by Carrie Chapman Catt in 1920, and local chapters like ours are still actively working today to support and educate voters. If you enjoyed this program, please consider contributing to our chapter. You can go to www.lwv dot bhmps dot org backslash get involved. This program is based on our book, and if you haven't already read it, we encourage you to get it on Amazon. The book highlights many other interesting facts about American feminism and discusses songs not covered in this program. For more information about the League of Women Voters chapter in your area, please go to www.lwv.org. But there's one of which we'll sing in this refrain. There are leagues both great and small, but the greatest one of all is the League of Women Voters will maintain. Wanna come and join the League of Women Voters? They are gaining greater power every day. Never striving for the right, never faltering in the fight. The woman voter is in the ring to stay. So I hope everyone now feels inspired. <laughs> I love that song. Who knew that the League of Women Voters had a song? That was such a fun thing to discover uh, doing this research, you know. Susan, can you hear me? I can hear everything perfectly right now. So yeah. So it was really one of the things that was very interesting about um, Laura and the uh, interns when they made the video, they were, it was interesting to watch their reactions to what had happened in the women's movement. Some of the young women felt that 
we really hadn't come very far. And several of the young women felt that we had come extremely far. One of the um, interesting events that happened for me was that the initial group of high school interns that worked on the book that they wrote called me from wherever they were working. I think it was the New Providence Public Library. And they were like, you have to come down here right away. We have to talk to you. And I went down and they said, did you know that birth control was illegal until like 1965? And I said, yeah. And they were, well, you know, that wasn't really that long ago. And I said, no, it, it wasn't that long ago. I mean, like that could have been when my mom or my grandmom would have been using birth control. And I said, yeah, that's, and they, they were just so overwhelmed by that whole concept because in their lifetime, that's been the norm. Even though they were only 18 years old, they recognized that that was something that was free and accessible to them or not free, but it's certainly freely accessible to them. Um, and I, I had said to them, you know, women have reproductive choices and some of those are gonna be taken away shortly. And they were like, no, 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 nothing like that's gonna ever happen. Mm, yeah, that's not the way it played out. So that, that was very um, interesting. Uh, so we're interested in what you folks might like to ask about or consider or any sort of anecdotes that you wanna toss into the pot. Um, we have some prepared questions if we need to switch over to those. Um, it's kind of like up to you in terms of what you wanna do. There should be a mechanism where you can raise your hand and uh, we'll see that you have a question or something that you'd like to say. If you look on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's, there should be a button that says, you know, raise hand and you just tap on that and we'll get a listing of whose hand is up. That might be the easiest way. I, there are about 20, 25 people that are locked into this right now, which is good. Um, so we're kind of like here for you if you want to do that. Yeah, I think it's very interesting to hear everybody's reactions um, to the documentary. And the book is different from, you know, we didn't just uh, uh, play songs that were in the book, though we do include some of them. Um, so it's been interesting for us, at least, to do this seminar uh, around the country with different groups of people because people uh, react differently to different messages contained in um, the documentary. It's also interesting for me to watch it now um, because obviously I wrote it pre-Dodds, Dobbs, um, you know, in anticipation of that uh, happening. And that was one reason why I focused so much on the New Jersey story about rights once gained can be lost because I was anticipating that. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear what reactions you might have, given the fact that just remember this came out in 2020 before some of the things that, that transpired uh, later. And if you don't know how to raise your hand, feel free to put any questions or any comments or thoughts in the chat, but um, be great to hear from folks. Otherwise, Susan and I will blather on and I don't know how exciting that is for you. And Laura, and, and you'll be sorry because Laura and I are not short on words, so it, it will be endless. Okay, we do have someone, uh, Doreen Real. I'm gonna open your line. Just make sure you unmute yourself. Hey, Doreen, how are you? Hi, I really, I really enjoy the program. And as well as the songs, I really enjoyed the graphics that you showed along with them, which gave very much of a feel of the period. Um, you, you talked about, um, how much social change will work at any given time? Maybe you could say more about that. Sure, it's, it's one thing that I think is very important for young people who want everything to be a perfect world tomorrow to understand um, is that you can achieve a lot of change overnight in, you know, when a law is changed. 
but it takes a long time to really reflect that change in people's hearts and minds. And that I'm so glad you picked up on that message because it's so important for people to understand that you can't, you can't, you know, I think of a culture or a society like a big ship on the ocean. You know, if it, you can't, you know, it takes a long time to turn that thing around. It takes a long time. And, and you know, a gradual change is really the only way to have lasting change. And sometimes you have to build up momentum um, to start the ship moving. You know, it takes a lot of effort to get it to turn. And, you know, it can, it can tack back and forth. Um, so that was, I think, one of the messages that I wanted to convey because I had been talking with... Um, it was funny, I was in Colombia actually in Bogota and I was taking an English class uh, around the time when I got the call from Susan to do a little copyright <laughs> analysis that then led to this. But at the time there were some uh, very young people, very adventurous people that had come to Colombia to learn Spanish for whatever reason, but I was the oldest person there. And one of the questions uh, that was posed in Spanish and all of our pidgin Spanish had to uh, revolved around, do we, how do, do we think the world is better than it was, you know, 10 years ago? And all of the people there was talked about how terrible life was, this, that, and the other. And I'm like, guys, we're, it's amazing what we've accomplished. You know, it's amazing how far we've gotten. You have to look at where we came from. And you also have to look at where things are elsewhere. Um, and just sort of having that perspective so that you don't give up and that you are an incrementalist and you're trying to chip away at changes to try to make sure those changes endure. I think for me, the biggest trauma, not tra biggest trauma, but like one of the scariest thing for me was looking down the eyes of um, abortion rights and knowing, you know, that that was going to be lost. I knew before the, before the case was leaked, I knew that was coming down. And it was because we did not continue to win over hearts and minds. We let everything, we just sort of rested, said, ah, oh, we got that. So we just sat pretty, but we didn't work. We didn't do the hard work and people's hearts and minds were not affected. And that is a dangerous place to be. So that was my long-winded response. That, that, okay. that certainly, I mean, you can see that in a, in a lot of uh, situations when a law is enacted. So the law says that uh, gay marriage is legal. That doesn't mean that that's not going to be threatened or overturned at a later time. Um, it, 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 there was a lot of work behind getting that law, you know, put into place and all the law suits and so on and so forth. So to get a decision that allowed that to, to be a reality. But the acceptance of that and how that actually translates into our culture, that's a whole different story. Clearly the fact uh, that women had the right to choose um, was never accepted wholly or fully in our culture. And, uh, you know, I think so, you, you, it's like a two-stage process. One is actually getting the uh, law into place or the decision made, putting enough pressure on people to get that decision to go in a certain direction. But even once that's done, what Laura's talking about is what happened was that once women were given the right to choose, it, everyone was like, oh, we're all done with that. We can, we can like go home now. And, and that's what happened. And so now it's something that's lost. Women lost the right to vote in New Jersey. Women have lost the right to choose in the United States. It's now a state-by-state -state event. Um, in the state of New York, we have a situation where it, it, it's confusing to older people anyway. It's, it is called the ERA and it's an equal rights amendment to the New York constitution though, and it's a completely different um, situation than if you're familiar with what happened in the 60s and the 70s. And what that, it's a constitutional amendment. It's been voted through twice now by both the House and the Senate in the state of New York. And now that that's happened twice, it will go before the public 
to be voted on because the entire state of New York is going to have to vote on that. What's unique about it is that it encompasses not just um, you know what you would expect it to encompass, but it also makes a constitutional amendment that protects what's being billed as pregnancy outcomes, which is a very interesting word choice, in my opinion. The idea is that if this can get voted through, then it can't be overturned by anyone else. But again, anything can be overturned once it's put into place. And that's what Laura is talking about. So that's the other windy version of the answer to your good question. Okay, we have another hand up, Linda Burns. If you please unmute yourself. Hi, Linda. Can me? We can. Yes. Okay. Um, when we had all our activities for the 100th anniversary, we got complaints about not including women of color. And I was pleased to see in this, you had many um, shots of women of, of color and their participation in the women's movement. Of course, we even had a member who was a person of color is saying that women of color had a march in the back of the parade. And I mean, as a white woman, I never thought of such a thing, but it did happen. So it was good to see that women of color were included in this. Yes, I mean, that was something that was very important to me as well. The various movements for equal rights and equality, um, both from a racial and a gender standpoint are entwined and they're also at odds because when you look at the history of the suffrage movement, a lot of, um, tactical decisions were made. Not only, you know, early on where we talk about, um, you know, uh, you know, the question of do we go state by state or do we try to gain the right to vote through a constitutional amendment? And that was a big debate mm -hmm. among suffragists of the time. But the way the messaging went through in the, the early 1900s, it was not a lockstep decision to focus on tolerance and equality. Progressives of the day did not tie all of their causes together. And so what you would you had happen in a lot of states is depending on where people were and to whom they were trying to appeal and win their vote, there were a lot of uh, people that appealed to racist voters uh, to try to gain their support for women's equality. Uh, or the right for women to vote by saying, well, you, you know, give women the right to vote and you'll double the number of white women, of white people who can vote in your area. And you can continue to try to, mm -hmm. you know, tamp down and prevent uh, uh, black people from voting. So, you know, it's, it's a fraught movement. And when you look at uh, the way different progressive causes work, there were other people in the in the women's movement uh, arguing that if women got the franchise, all of a sudden, all the progressive causes from the communists and the socialists yeah. and, and children's rights activists, all of these things would miraculously be voted into law because all of a sudden you'd have this big block of voters who, of course, would put their children first or would, of course, vote one way or another. Women have never, other than, you know, African-American women have been a voting block, but otherwise, uh, all women have never been this voting block that a lot of the progressive activists who are supporting women's voting rights claim they would be. So it's an interesting dynamic. Um, and you can't predict what's going to happen when you advocate for political change. There's a lot of unintended consequences that come with this. But um, yeah, it's, I think it's important to tell the good, the bad, and the ugly around any story, because there's nothing that's perfect about any movement for change. There's a lot of, of evil that's done in the name of good. Um, and we have to recognize that. Okay, so I think we have another question. Uh, sure, uh, Adelaide DeGiorgi, I will yeah. open your line. Please unmute yourself. Okay, actually, Susan answered what I was going to speak to, which was about the Equal Rights Amendment here in New York. And basically, 
I remember in the 90s going to league conventions, especially one in DC, where that was a very hot topic. I'm seriously hoping that sometime in my life, since I'm now in my mid 80s, that that will come to pass. But so far, no luck. Uh, but good to see you, Susan. I have. And thank you, Laura. Thank you. It'll be an interesting question because laws change and interpretations of constitutional laws uh, change quite a lot. So the fact that the ERA did not pass based on the language, which was taken pretty much, you know, it's, it's almost a carbon copy of, I, I can't remember whether it's a 13th Amendment or the 12th Amendment, but it's a, it's a carbon copy of the amendment uh, that said you, you can't, um, you know, that there's equality based on, on race and you can't take race into account. And so it'll be interesting to see how that kind of plays out uh, if we ever get it passed, given the current composition of the courts, you know? Well, we're, we're very hopeful that the constitutional amendment in New York will be in, For the state constitution. I think state constitutions state constitution. are the way to go with the yeah. ERA. I think the federal, I, I don't know, I, I, I hope, you know, New Jersey, it, it makes me very uncomfortable because they claim that equal rights kind of exist, but there's no language anywhere, you know, <laughs> and so it's all judge made law. So if you can get uh, an amendment passed to the constitution that really lays it out, especially if it includes bodily autonomy in there, that's awesome. We're hopeful. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to open Maureen Whitley's line. Just please unmute yourself. Very cool. <laughs> hey, Susie, how are you? Good. How so, are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, you know, I, I am um, an escort. The best, Maureen. So Maureen, <laughs> Maureen was a mom of a young man that I taught when he was in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, who is yep. now a... Uh, He's got a JD like you, Laura, from Harvard. Oh, yes, wow. he, yeah, he does. He, yeah. yeah, he's all grown up now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I'm an escort for Planned Parenthood in Massachusetts, and you would think it would be an easy job, and, it, and it's not an easy job. Um, the Commonwealth um, here is, um, it, it, it's, it's quite sad how, how we've gone backwards. And what do you think? will happen in, in light of Dobbs? Do you, do you think we'll be able to get, you know, our autonomy back? Do you think that is possible? I think a lot of people are gonna die before that happens. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I think the more it's, you know, we need our, you know, there was a, in Ireland, it was a dentist who died as a result of sepsis um, because she was not able to obtain an abortion. Um, and I think we're going to need uh, death and suffering um, before change happens. Um, it's, 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 it's a hard topic for me to talk about because try as I might, I on, and I have tried to understand the opposing side, it's not something that is rational or logical. And so you're, you're working um, with Planned Parenthood of Massachusetts. The Planned Parenthood of Maine has a wonderful uh, outreach program that they utilize in their state, which deals with um, talking to people, talking to people about abortion, just doing surveys and trying to assess uh, where people are on the topic. And by approaching things in an open-ended conversation, um, you'd be surprised at the impact that having those conversation has, uh, does in a one-on-one -on -one setting, just to sort of inquire about people's viewpoints and to share stories. And that has had a major impact on people's views on the topic of abortion. And we need more conversations like that going on everywhere. And I think these movements to say, shout your abortion story, that's not the same. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having dialogue with people who disagree with you 
in an open-ended way. And I think the only chance that we have to actually change hearts and minds um, is gonna be a combination of women suffering um, and preferably the suffering of women who people can see as uh, people who should not suffer. So it's going to be young girls. It's going to be uh, young white girls. It's going to be people, rich people's daughters, if you can get them to suffer. So the more suffering that happens on the one hand, and it's going to be dialogue on the other. And to me, that's this is my two cents. Uh, I think that's the only way we we regain rights um, across the country. Um, and it's going to be ugly. That's my perspective. Thank you. I'm not sure I disagree with any of that. And, and, I, and I think that's very unfortunate. I think that, you know, part of my concern is having reached the age where I am, I've seen a lot of instances of um, situations that are very unpleasant for all different kinds of young women. And, you know, but as long, so I'll, I'll just tell you a quick story. So there was a fellow who was uh, a very well-connected right-wing Republican and very anti-reproductive um, rights, very, and very powerful. So we'll just leave that there. And when his, a friend of mine is a physician, and when his, this person, this politically planted person's 16 year old daughter became pregnant that child um you know he immediately sought for an opportunity for termination of that pregnancy for his daughter and when my friend confronted him about that he said how is it that you can deny every other woman that on the face of the planet if you have your way the right to make a decision like your own daughter is making or you're making with your daughter, or I don't know what the family dynamics were. And he said, well, she made a mistake. <laughs> so somehow because her, his own daughter had made a mistake, that, that meant that, that there was no issue as far as he was concerned. It was just a mistake. And so it needed to be corrected. And, you know, and, and that's, so you're talking about actually firsthand experience, but even in that situation, the firsthand experience with his own child, okay, mm -hmm. not his daughter's friend or something like that, he, he, he just blew it off. It was, well, it was a mistake that was, you know, so I, I don't really know what the answer is other than getting women, you know, I believe that you need to get women into the political hierarchy that exists and go back and, and make these laws change to protect the pregnancy outcomes for all women, to whatever they may be. Um, and that's your choice, hopefully, again, maybe. But, but even with that politician, some of it is training people to have those conversations and interrogating yeah. the yeah. person, you know, not just the hypocrisy, because that hypocrisy exists throughout everything where, you know, the rules are for thee, not me, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But interrogating the question of well, why, you know, what, why is it immoral, you know, and just questioning some of the basic assumptions, because I think it's, it's very hard for someone to take a look at, um, you know, a, a set of cells, unless they're really, a, a, their, their religious faith is, is, extraordinarily strong, but it's very hard to take a look at a pair of cells and say that that is the equivalent of a three-year-old. It's yeah. just, it's, it's very, very difficult for people um, to, to hold those views. And I think just, uh, you know, inquiry without attack is the strongest tool in any organization that's seeking to change people's perspectives, but you will not change it in that conversation. People have to change their minds on their own, and it takes many conversations and lots of time for people to come up with their own viewpoint. Even though Maine's uh, research has shown that a lot of times within a conversation, because they always start out with a question like a one to 10, where are you on this, on the topic of abortion, and then they end with that on one to 10, and usually people move a point or two. Um, but still, because 
it it just people have to change their minds on their own. You cannot, you will never get into an argument or discussion with someone and walk away and someone's like, you're absolutely right. I was so wrong. Thank you for setting me straight. <laughs> like <laughs> that would be a miracle, you know. Uh, so yeah. thank you. So we have a couple more minutes and we'd love to hear from um, maybe someone else. If not. I see Virginia has a hand sure. up. Hold on one moment. Yeah. Please unmute yourself. Virginia Lanigan, your line is open. Just unmute yourself, please. And if you move your cursor to the bottom of the screen, there's on the left hand side, there should be a little microphone that has a red slash through it. If you just click on that, you can unmute yourself. Oh, you got it. And then it went back on. Try again. If you're having trouble, you can also type your question into the chat box. Oh, your settings are preventing you from doing it. Well, type your question right in and we'll we'll try to answer or your 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 point. Um, and I'm curious after Virginia gets her 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 question or comment typed in, I'm curious if people um responded to the music at all. Uh, you know, if, if those songs, if any of the songs that were referenced were songs that were close to them. What impact has Dodd had on the registration of young women voters? Well, you've seen what's happened in Kansas. Um, you know, uh, when, you know, in terms of voter registration, there's been a tremendous uptick in various jurisdictions where uh, abortion rights is under threat um, with uh, women's registrations outpacing men's. Um, I don't know about the youth. Um, I haven't seen statistics on that, but I have definitely seen a gender breakdown that they saw um, in the wake of Dodds. But I think the question is also, is that sustainable? And you know, you know, one of the one of the questions. It's very hard for people. You know. I think the shock, not the shocking thing, but for many, many, many women, um, the abuse and discrimination they experience as a woman is maybe not the worst thing about their lives. And so when they go out to the ballot box, top issue is not necessarily the fact that uh, they don't have bodily autonomy. Um, and so we'll have to see what comes of that, you know? Um, I, I wish I could say that was the that was the answer. You know, there's never any one answer. It's always several. I, I think also that because where we live, I know for for myself, because we live in, you know, like I live in New York and Laura lives in, in New Jersey. I think that we I haven't seen the impact as well as I might have seen if I lived in a state well, like the other 48 states, no, other than California. But I mean, I don't live in like Indiana or Kentucky or, you know, Missouri or Texas, that type of thing. So I'm not, I'm not really that aware. I'm more focused on my local um, issues. And it's not really been an issue in the state of New York or New Jersey, like it's been in a number of these other states. Yes, um, you know, being an escort, like uh, Maureen was talking about, that's going to be an issue. I don't care where you are because there are protesters outside every um, clinic that exists on the face of the planet. That's just like, a, that's something that, that's an expectation that women need to be apprised of before they go to clinics, which they're often not, but that's another story. Um, so I feel sort of like out of touch with that. And that's a really good question. And I hope leagues in other states are, are really pondering that because the voting is going to be critical and the women probably 
I don't know. I don't really know what, that's a good question. Really good question. Hmm. Okay. So does anyone else have a question or a comment? Because we are pretty good in this. I think we're, uh, I'd like to really thank uh, Carrie for her help in getting this set up and this really worked out well. Yeah. And um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us tonight. And I hope you um, liked what you saw. And if you have a group that would be interested in us doing this with them, we are available to do that. We don't charge. We've done it a lot. And with all kinds, big groups, little groups, libraries, book clubs, you name it, we've done it with them, you know, groups of like four, you know, that's fine. Uh, we're good to go. So anyway, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.